record now. And uh, we hand over to Mary. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today as a bonus ad about learning disabilities. And um, so just a bit about me. Um, I'm an assistant clinical psychologist in a community learning disability team over in Macclesfield. And I work with the team of it's a multidisciplinary team. So I work with other psychologists, with psychiatrists with nurses, um, occupational therapists, physiotherapy, and, and, and more, really. And we all come together to help support people in the community that have learning disabilities. Um, the talk will include my own personal experiences over the years. It will have anecdotes and stories. It will have real experiences of people, whether that's um, clients themselves or whether it's the families um, it will have thoughts from the staff members that I work with and there'll be a couple of research uh, like mentions of research papers and if you would like um, any of the research links just let me know afterwards and I can shoot them over to you but it would be really good if this is interactive so if there's any questions or comments along the way feel free if um, like a bonus said to pop it in the comment section or just just yeah chip in but yeah so So just thought it was, it's really important before we start anything to have some opening reflections, um, because I think as we go through the talk, it's important to be checking in with ourselves and asking us some questions so we can reflect. So why is this relevant? Why is this talk relevant in this day and age? Why are we talking about mental health? Um, it's, a growing, it's a growing issue and we always need to be aware. We need to understand and learn more. Um, it's important for the church. It's import, important to our service. And how is it important to me? How is it important to like, each one of us in our spiritual journey and our walk with Christ? And what do we need to do? And what do we need to change to improve things? I think that's a really, it's going to be a running theme throughout the presentation and something that we constantly, I think, need to check in with ourselves um, in practice and in our, in our own spiritual journey. So that's something to reflect on. And just to say that while I was doing this presentation and preparing it, I felt like it was really good because it challenged, I, I felt like it was challenging my own preconceived judgments, my own internal stigma. You know, I think sometimes it's very easy when, when you're stood in church and you see somebody, you know, that's a child that's really, really, uh, you know, loud or disruptive or somebody that could be quite challenging. And it's really, really easy to kind of not be that patient. And, and it, I think it highlighted, to me on my own weaknesses what I can work on you know I'm somebody that works with um, these individuals and yet I still have a lot to learn and I still have a, a lot to gain I think um, from these presentations and from learning so yeah so it really challenged that from, for me how can this and this is another question how can this better shape me as a member of the body of Christ I think we all add something and we all bring something we can all serve we can all love doesn't we can never we can always learn to love more and I think that's something really important to ask ourselves throughout this presentation as well how can I be a better member in, in the body of Christ and are we a voice for those who do not have one that was something else as I was preparing this presentation are we a voice for those who are needy for those who require our help um, for those, like I say, who do not have one, who can't communicate their needs, um, are we that voice for them? Are we there to be their advocate and support them? So that's something as well to think about. But let's get going. So something else, this is a quote. Um, it will all make sense at the end, but I just wanted to share it. It's being in the room is not the same as being part of the family. It will make sense as we go on but I, do, I really want you to think about that for a second so being in the room is not the same as being part of the family so let's just define learning disability so a learning disability affects the way a person learns things throughout their life it's a lifelong condition it's not something that can magically you know disappear it's not something that you know you can suddenly find a cure for you take medication treatment you've got it for life and um, you can obviously do things to enhance the quality of life for someone. However, 
they will always have a learning disability if they've been home. Sorry, someone's mic on, or is that me? It's different for everyone. So no two persons are the same. So um, somebody, you know, client X could have a learning disability, client Y could have a learning disability, but it manifests completely different in each person. And um, this is important that when we diagnose someone with a learning disability, we usually do a cognitive assessment called the WAVE. And before we start the cognitive assessment, we always say each person has their own strengths and weaknesses. So you may be better at some things and you may struggle with others, but that's completely normal. And you know yourself, you know that you are better at some things and you might be a bit worse at others and that's totally fine. We all, we're all good at some and, and potentially need help in other things. So the same applies to somebody with learning disabilities. They will still score stronger on particular items um, or indexes however they might struggle in, in other things and like I say no two people are the same so we need to find specific ways to support each person individually in a person-centered way. So a person with a learning disability might find difficulty in understanding new or complex information, uh, they might find it difficult to learn new skills and they might find it difficult to cope independently and we talk about that in terms of they might have impaired social functioning. So that means, you know, um, having lasting relationships, being able to socialise, um, being able to have that kind of um, pick up on social cues, things like that. Also impaired adaptive functioning. So that's things like looking after themselves, completing everyday activities, household tasks, budgeting, managing money and things, just things like that. So in that area, it would be impaired as well. So the National Institute of Health and Care states that a learning disability is generally defined by three core criteria. So a low intellectual ability, so that means an IQ of less than 70, um, significant impairment of social adaptive functioning, like we said in the previous slide, and the onset has to be in childhood. So somebody uh, that's an adult wouldn't suddenly appear to have a learning disability. It might have been undiagnosed, but it should always have started from early childhood. Uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders also defines a learning disability as having limited functioning in three areas. So that's your social skills, conceptual skills and your practical skills. So they all mirror each other basically in, in their diagnostic criteria. And the World Health Organization defines intellectual disability as a condition of incomplete development of the mind, which is especially characterized by impairment of skills manifested during the developmental period, which contributes to the overall level of intelligence, cognitive language, motor and social abilities. So the key thing is incomplete development of the mind, so the brain isn't fully developed, and they'll have an impairment of skills, like social skills, conceptual skills, practical skills, and that contributes to the overall level of intelligence, which will be quite low. Now, there, now it's important to note that learning disabilities are on a continuum. So you can have, someone can have a mild learning disabilities, a mild learning disability it could be moderate, it could be severe, or it could be profound. And that's what I mean when I say it manifests in different ways and each person is different. So for a mild learning disability, this can often go um, undiagnosed. We have a lot of adults coming you know, they could be mid fifties and they're querying whether they have a learning disability. And it turns out that they do have a mild one uh, because it, on the surface, it appears like they can cope. You know, they can mix well with others. They can have meaningful relationships. They can communicate their needs proper, appropriately and, and they can contribute to society to an extent. But they may need tasks with, you know, more complex things, you know, budgeting. They might be, they might find things like maths or arithmetic quite difficult. They might find reading a bit tricky you know, things like completing forms they might struggle with. For someone to have a moderate learning disability, this requires a certain level of support. Um, so they're likely to have some language skills. So that means that they can com communicate about their day-to-day. -day. So there's, that's basic communication levels. However, they may need support with caring for themselves and carrying out everyday tasks more than somebody that had a mild learning disability. So this is where it starts to go into the point where you, you consider giving, uh, considering offering support. Somebody with a 
severe learning disability requires a very high level of support. So they can often use basic words and gestures to communicate, but they might still find it quite difficult to communicate their needs. Um, they would definitely need support with everyday activities, whether it's cooking, cleaning, shopping, whatever it is. But they can tend to look after some, if not all, of their own personal care needs. Um, they might need some prompting throughout. Though. They might need to be you know, reminded, you know, you need to have a shower or you need to brush your teeth, things like that. Things that um, somebody that's neurotypical and able can just prompt themselves to do these things. Um, they can also have additional medical needs or mobility issues as well on top of that. Now, profound learning disability, somebody with a profound learning disability, could, is, these people are some of the most disabled individuals in our communities, and they tend to have multiple disabilities. So they wouldn't just have a learning disability, they could have a disability alongside it. Uh, they might be blind, uh, they might have severe mobility issues in a wheelchair. Um, these people have severe limited understanding and difficulty communicating and often, and often are nonverbal. And if Oh, this is a stretch I'd say they can express themselves using minimal words but it tends to be symbols it tends to be you know um, via gestures so yes yeah, it's, it's very very tricky and they need support in pretty much every aspect um, including challenging behaviour we find that people with profound learning disabilities tend to have and exhibit the most challenging behaviour because a lot of their needs aren't being met and they, they really struggle to communicate that so causes, so we don't always know why a person has a learning disability, um, but sometimes it's because a person's brain development has been affected, whether that's before they were born, whether it's during the birth or in early childhood. So for example, um, uh, if someone's mother became ill during pregnancy, that might impact them then developing a learning disability. Complications during birth could stop the brain getting enough oxygen. So again, affecting the brain development. And it could also be hereditary. So genes passed on from parents could then make having a learning disability more likely or an illness in early childhood, illness or injury, for example, meningitis, or, you know, they've fallen and they've really, really injured their head. That could also contribute to somebody developing a learning disability. But if you notice, it's always to do with early childhood. That's when you would be developing it. At most, you wouldn't be developing it later. Also, some health conditions can make it more likely to have a learning disability. For example, someone with Down syndrome will always have a learning disability. Um, it's very common for people with cerebral palsy to also have a learning disability. Same with epilepsy. Uh, and people with autism tend to have a learning disability as well. Everybody that I've ever worked with um, with autism in the past has had a learning disability. I mean, it's not a rule, but it's very, very common. So bear that in mind. So now we're going to get a bit more personal. I think um, we've got through the whole scientific aspect so far, but now it's important to think properly what it's like for the person to have a learning disability. First thing, which really, really crops up um, when I'm working with people, is it's incredibly isolating. If you think about it just from a spiritual point of view, each one of us has a really vulnerable heart that's been created by God and for God. And if you think about yourself, we all yearn to love and to be loved and valued. Now, people with a learning disability also have these same needs. They also have a heart that's been created by God. And yet it can be very easy for people with learning disabilities to feel like they're, they're not understood. And it's very common for, for them to feel like they do not belong where they are in any community, um, within their friends, whether it's school, in whatever setting, it's very common for people with learning disabilities to feel like they do not belong. Grief and loss. I think very often we speak of grief and loss in the context of losing someone dear to us, uh, you know, losing a job, losing a relationship. However, we never think about it in the context of what could have been. A very, very, very common theme that comes up with the clients that I work with is that they are grieving the loss of a normal life what their life could have been like had they not had a learning disability. This is a quote from a client that I work with. I wish I could have been normal. Why can't I be? They actually said that quote and I, and I remember writing it down because I found it very evocative and I found it really, really moving because if you think about it, for, for them, they yearn to have a normal life 
of the things that we take for granted. So things like learning to drive, um, having a job, being able to go on public transport without having to have support, just basic things that we really, really take for granted that they yearn to have. Um, devalued. So there's something called the second handicap. So when somebody is handicapped, mentally handicapped, we look at that as a primary handicap. So that's the diagnosis. So somebody with a learning disability is mentally handicapped and that's their primary handicap. Now the secondary handicap is a concept that has been derived to explain how the external world or people or services can actually restrict the individual with the disability even further by saying, oh, no, no, they can't do that. They've got a learning disability or, oh, no, we best not give that to them. It's too hard for them. They won't understand. And actually, we should be doing the opposite. Instead of disabling them and disempowering them, we should be doing the opposite. We should encourage them. We should empower them. We should allow them to, you know, we should create the space for them to expand and to utilize the gifts that God has given them because God has given them gifts and we should be the ones that, you know, propel that and motivate, motivate them further. Another client of mine has always complained of this and said that, you know, whether it's staff or whether it's their family, they feel like they are always restricted. Well, I can't do this because, um, you know, my, my, my parents are so worried about me and, and I feel like I don't have, you know, I can't do what other people do. And, and my staff say that I can't do this because I'm not able to do that and, and I want to try it. And in turn, they feel like they will never be good enough. And self-esteem is something that's really, really cropped up with um, clients with learning disabilities. They always feel like they're not good enough. Shame. This is a very, also a very, very common feeling that crops up. This is a quote from a paper. It's a qualitative paper. So it was somebody was interviewing somebody with a learning disability and they said, when you have a learning difficulty, you get picked on by normal children. When you are an adult, you still get picked on. And I find it hard. I wish they would leave us alone. So with that, when you, if you feel like, you know, if being bullied and being taunted for having a, having a learning disability, with that comes, you know, a degree of shame. That's something to consider. Fear and anxiety, which is often masked by challenging behaviour. I think... Um, a lot of the people that we work with, they have, they have a lot of fear. They have fear of failure. If you think about it, if you know that you have a learning disability and you know that you are, you know, that you can't do something, you, are, you, are, you almost feel like you need to overcompensate and you need to try much harder. And with that, you might feel fear of failure. I'm really worried about getting it wrong. I'm really worried, you know, I'm going to get embarrassed. Someone's going to see that I've got it wrong. And with that fear of rejection, fear of rejection, am I going to be included? Are people going to, you know, um, are people going to want to speak to me or am I going to be sidelined because of this? And as well, fear of ridicule, like I said above. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people I work with, um, they're adults now. However, they always say that when they were children, they were bullied at school. Uh, they went to mainstream school, normal schools, and um they found it really, really tricky because people would bully them, sideline them because of their learning disability. Extra effort. So I want you to imagine that they are functioning in a world that is so hard for them to decode. We can navigate the world in a very natural way. You know, we know how to read people, we know how to communicate, we know how to gesture, we know social cues, you know, we know how to understand the world around us. Now, people with a learning disability have to try, I can't even say triple hard, they have to try so incredibly hard to function in the world that we live in, that it's so difficult for them to decode that. And just as something for us to reflect on, I want you to think for a moment, imagine you're in a room you're the only one in a room with a people, like 20 other people speaking a different language that you have no idea what they're saying and you cannot understand a single word. I tried to put myself in that situation. I tried to imagine myself in that situation. I thought, how would I feel? I'd feel isolated, but I'd feel embarrassed. I'd feel really flustered that I didn't understand what was going on. I'd feel worried, like, what are they talking about? And yet I could probably still get by by understanding, you know, facial expressions, gestures, um, 
a smile, whatever, I could just about get by. Now imagine somebody with learning disability, this is their day to day. And not just that, it's even more, the, the getting by is, is, is to a minimum. So try and put yourself in a situation next time you, you, if you deal with somebody with a learning disability, remember that they are trying extra, extra hard to understand you, to be patient. Another aspect to consider what it's like for the family. Now, I'm lucky enough to work with a psychiatrist whose child actually has a severe learning, um, learning disability. So I managed to have like an informal discussion kind of interview type thing with him and I asked him some questions and he was happy to share um, things with me for this presentation to inform us all. He said the first thing that crops up for the family is the emotional baggage. So he too spoke about guilt, he spoke about shame, he spoke about not being able to meet societal expectations, you know, of what the perfect family is like. And he's of he's Asian, so he as well understands that feeling of community of, you know, he said um, there was like almost this embarrassment when we go to these functions with the wider community, people will be looking at my son and, and judging. And he said it was just, he felt a lot of shame. Something very interesting was he said, it feels like chronic bereavement. And he said something that he would really, really like, especially communities, you know, faith and religion to understand is, we point and we turn to our faith when we lose something. We know ourselves, if we lose someone dear to us, we, we go to God, we have that comfort in the loss and, and, and we can make sense of that loss by, by gaining that comfort from God. And he said, but, you, but the faith can support us in a loss that's very acute, in the acute stage, you know? We grieve and we grieve about the person we've lost and, and, and we feel like God's there and, and you know we feel that peace and comfort from that but, but as time goes on you know that that pain eases and we are able to carry on with our lives and things kind of go back to normal you know we still grieve but we learn to get on with it better he said having somebody and having a child with a learning disability it's a chronic bereavement and it's a chronic loss that you live your whole life so that's something really important to people who don't have that to understand that it is a chronic loss that we constantly every day are reminded of. And he said this, every stage of development of life, there is a reminder that your son or daughter hasn't reached that stage. It's fresh every single time we are reminded of that. That's really, really, I found that really emotive and I found that, yeah, I found that really, really stuck and I, I feel like I won't forget that. He also said there's impact on family as a whole. So, you know, if the person with learning disability has a sibling, for example, that sibling will lose out on a lot of things. There's going to be a lot of compromise. For example, we, they won't be able to go to their favourite club that they want to go to after school because, uh, you know, there's no, somebody needs to stay at home to look after the person with learning disability. It's things like that. And, you know, you feel like you constantly have to compromise and lose out on things. And, and that's something that we, we really do take for granted, you know, he said we have to think not just as one person but as a unit and for a sibling that's that's incredibly difficult you know especially growing up if you think oh I can't do this or I can't go out with my friends I've got to look after you know my sibling it's it's it's, it's obviously great and, and they learn the meaning of service but by the at the same time they will feel like they're losing out on a lot of things so that's something to consider he also talks about community integration so he too spoke about not feeling like the not just the individual doesn't belong but the family as a whole feel like they can't belong he said it's really hard to fit in or belong in any community um, because you feel like uh, reasonable adjustments can't be made and you feel like there's that families don't feel like they can be supported and feel genuinely part of community so this is something this is um, a research paper if you are interested in it there um, I've linked it However, I've got the actual research paper, so if anybody wants to give me a shout afterwards, I can link it to, uh, to you. So this is uh, somebody's actual lived experience of, of living with a learning disability. It's called, the paper itself is called Emma's Story, and these are direct quotes from what she said. So the overarching themes that came up was the first one was blame. She really wanted to blame something or someone for this learning disability. She said, I didn't ask for this. I've suffered all my life. She said, 
It is difficult to think about how and why I have a learning disability. Everybody doesn't understand. I want to know what caused it. Doctors should be able to save me. The midwife should have kept an eye on me when I was growing in my mum's tummy. Mum and dad should have looked after me properly. This shouldn't happen in the first place. So obviously, Bertha, she doesn't have the understanding to know why she's got this learning disability. And she's really, really, really trying to blame someone. She's trying to find something to blame, whether it's the doctor, the midwife, mum and dad should have looked after me. And there's that feeling of this just really shouldn't have happened. The second um, overarching theme is anger. Um, anger would, would come up a lot in, in, in the interview said I'm not a fast learner and people call me lazy and it is not laziness and it is called learning difficulties I'm angry and learning difficulties is not nice and it is not fair and this learning difficulties where did it come from they don't deserve it she's so here you can feel that she's really trying to express her frustration that you know people misconstrue the fact that you know if she if she doesn't understand something or if she doesn't do something it's not because she's lazy or demotivated it's because she literally can't and that angers her a lot because people just don't understand and and as again she says it's not nice and it's not fair and i found this interesting because she took we touched on faith here so emma actually looked to a higher being for her own explanation she's trying to find someone to blame or she's trying to find you know something to make sense of this of this uh, of the fact she's got a learning disability it says emma asks god each night when she prays to explain to her why she has learning difficulties Emma also visited Lords to ask the Lady Mary to cure her learning difficulties, but this did not happen. Emma therefore feels angry with God and she says that this is a hard feeling to bear. I found that really interesting and, and I found it quite poignant, especially in our church, to understand that actually a lot of people, you know, they could and a lot of families might blame God and think, well, why did God allow this to happen? And for somebody with a learning disability to have that almost insight themselves to think, why did God allow this to happen? I just really wanted to share that because of course, there's going to be a lot of feelings cropping up there. The third thing, again, like I said earlier, was the feeling of loss. Loss is a really, really big thing for all people with learning disabilities. Emma here says it is like being paralysed. Having learning difficulties is awful and it is not nice to go backwards and learning difficulties is stopping me from getting what I want and it is being called a child and being treated like a child. So Emma is an adult, I've forgotten how old she was, I've got to, uh, in the paper how old it said she was, I think she was, you know, late 20s. But imagine constantly being treated like a child and feeling like you're constantly regressing and going backwards and, and feeling like you can't, you know, live a life the same way, you know, other, other adults can and live a normal life, as she says. If I didn't have a learning disability, I would have my own life and it would be easy to do normal things. I want to work for the same reason other people want to work, which is to support myself and to feel like part of the world. Why is that so hard for people to understand? This was taken from another qualitative um, paper from somebody that was interviewed back in 1990. So as you can see, this is just an overarching theme of loss that all people with learning disabilities may experience. So now we think about the difficulties of the person, um, sorry, difficulties of how someone could be supporting this person because there are barriers and we need to overcome them and we need to really really reflect and think of ways that we can we can support each other and how we can support people with learning disabilities the first thing that crops that comes to mind is deficits in communication so quite clearly it can be hard for you to understand the person and for them to understand you as i said before a lot of them find it very difficult to communicate their needs and and their wishes and for you to understand that person how can you help them if you don't know what they're saying and and what their needs are and of course how then can they understand you if, if they're struggling with understanding and comprehension in general so yeah that leads on to understanding needs it can be very difficult to support somebody with learning disability because there's always a reason why a behaviour might be happening. Somebody might be screaming, shouting, kicking, hitting, and we might be finding it really tricky to understand why is that person behaving the way they are. But ultimately, this is a rule of thumb. The per there is always a reason why somebody is engaging in a particular behaviour, and it's because they're trying to communicate a need that is not being met. 
So they could be shouting because they are hungry, but they can't communicate that. They could be screaming because they really want to escape a place that they find really, you know, they're not enjoying it. They're not in, they, they don't want to be there, but they don't know how to say that. So they could be screaming. So then the person removes them from that situation. So we need to find other ways to learn how to understand the needs of the person, even if it is not clear at first. You need to remember, it's very simple for us. If I don't like something, I can go, oh, OK, I'm not enjoying this. I'm just going to step outside. And um, people with learning disability don't have like those communication skills. Presentation and behaviours. When we talk about presentation, we talk about how the person is presenting themselves. So we can say this the client presents as anxious, client, this client presents as fidgety and so on. So we might see behaviours, especially in the mask, for example, somebody could have tics, they, there could be a lot of loud noises, they could be stimming. So stimming is when somebody is um, engaging in self-stimulatory self behaviour. So it's something that they find um, self-stimulating self sorry I'm, I'm um, <laughs> it's quite a tongue twister <laughs> but yeah and um, these things we might you know we might not engage in and there might be certain behaviors that we think oh why is that happening and it might seem disruptive especially if we look at it in the context of our mass in terms of the church day in terms of Sunday school but we need to learn to accommodate and be tolerant and understanding of why these behaviors are taking place and why this individual is doing these things and how we can make reasonable adjustments so that they can still access these things such as Sunday school and mass and so on but in a way that they feel like they can participate in a way that is more meaningful to them. The other thing that we might find difficult is realigning our expectations. I think it's very, very easy, especially when we're in church, to go in and go, right, we need to be really respectful. We need to be really quiet, not to sound in mass. We need to really honour church and honour where we're stood, which is completely true. However, the individuals um, that we work with, they, sorry, that we deal with, that aren't cognitively able to understand the social construct construct of being quiet or being respectful. So to them, they could be really, really happy and they could be really, really you know, joyful. And their way of communicating that is being super, super loud and shouting. And yet that could come across really disruptive in church when they could actually be really happy that they're there. So we kind of we need to kind of realign those expectations and not apply the normal rules of social behaviour and expectations to that particular individual and find other ways, again, reasonable adjustments. So what are the blessings of having a relationship with such a person? And this is where we become, we start now to think more deeply in terms of our own spiritual lives and our own spiritual journey. This picture here, can somebody um, just, more interactive what's happening here in this picture anyone speak up <laughs> is this a uh, simon of cyrene helping christ with the cross yeah yes it is thank you um so yeah so simon here is carrying the cross as jesus walks to um walks to Golgotha, he is literally carrying his cross. So what does that mean for us? How can we translate this in our own service? Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Um, this is really, really important, guys. I think sometimes we don't realise the magnitude of the blessing here. To help somebody carry their own cross, to help somebody in their suffering and to be there beside them in companionship and to be there to aid them, to carry the cross with them, to carry the burden, the pain. It's a real, real blessing. It's something that is really precious in the eyes of God. And this is really important for the people we work with and their families, because we don't realize how much they suffer. Uh, people with learning disabilities, their internal world is a lot more, it's a lot more complicated, even if it might not appear on the surface. And uh, for the families behind closed doors, in church, whatever it is, their experiences will be really, really difficult and really challenging. So we need to be there as a family to bear one another's burdens. Here, I found this um, a really nice image as well, because this is just a normal person carrying 
someone's cross but who are they who is the per who is the person that is there that they are helping they're helping christ and it reminds me of this verse truly i tell you whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine you did for me so it's really important um people with learning disabilities or with mental health problems in general they can be sidelined and so or they could just be outcasted and so we need to we need to really really challenge ourselves and ask ourselves are we doing enough for them are we serving them and reminding ourselves that if we serve them we are serving christ so experiences in the church this is a bit more interactive um, I've spoken a lot now. I've set, I'm going to set a five minute timer just so we are strict and sticking to time. Um, but what do you think a person with learning disabilities experience could be within the church? Now, it could be a good experience. It could be a negative experience. But I want this just to be quite an interactive discussion. So feel free, guys, to now discuss with each other. Um, what you think? I am setting a timer now, so we are starting on five minutes. So somebody, um, by all means, chip in. I think that from from my experience as a priest, um, I should be looking to include in the service of the church everyone who wants to participate, uh, and so I do have boys especially boys serving in the altar even with me uh, who have various uh, disabilities of different kinds um, what I'm having to learn is is both to expect more of them but also to expect less of them if you know what I mean um, to expect that they are able to participate in their own way uh, and not to demand that they participate uh, in the way that perhaps I expected a couple of years ago. So that's a real yeah. blessing for me to see to see everyone having a chance to participate uh, to the best of their abilities. And that's the same rule for everyone, uh, trying to allow every person to participate to the best of their abilities. Perfect, yeah. Thank you, Abona. thanks. So anyone else, um, how do you think if you were really, you know, thinking, putting yourself in their shoes, how a person with learning disabilities, what their experience would be like in a normal church day. Can, can I say something, Mary? Uh, sure. Yeah, uh, I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to embarrass you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, in, in Sunday school, um, uh, we, we, especially in the ages when they start to become starting to grow out of the very very young age i mean i typically t it, it seven seven to nine eight years seven to nine how 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 can how can they because sometimes especially if they have got mild mild uh, uh, learning this this difficulty or disability how can someone like me who doesn't know enough about that differentiate someone who is disinterested from someone who has got that because i, I worry that uh, many of them could feel intimidated by someone like me trying to interact with them and engage them and ask them questions that must be frightening to them and at the same time, it can be frustrating for me in my ignorance that I feel they are not replying or responding to me. Mm -hmm. So that, that's an important point. And, and of course, the, in relation to the others around them, because I have seen this time and time again, some people who might appear to, to, to the unskilled person like me that they are probably having learning difficulty. When they started to... Um, say something that might appear silly or uh, 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 less appropriate or wrong even answering question people started laughing at them and making fun of them and so on so it must be a, a strange and difficult world for them uh, yeah, and, and yeah. isolated as you say they feel lonely and they feel uh, in they are in a hostile environment not only lonely yeah sure definitely that's a big point that's a really important point so you know how others treat them and how others view them and um, it can be embarrassing and isolating like you said so yeah you're right um we've got literally two more minutes so does anyone else have anything they want to say uh, 
I will say just for 30 seconds that um, I have been, you know, as a priest, especially, I have been in places where everyone is speaking Arabic, um, mm, not mm. only in the UK, but, but abroad, when I've been, been abroad in the service. Mm. And uh, although I am fairly mature and, and robust myself, most of those feelings are there to some extent that you described. Um, mm. I, I don't feel them overwhelmingly because uh, I'm an introvert anyhow, but, but you do feel embarrassed. You do feel a bit shameful. Uh, people are talking, people are even smiling at you and talking, and you have no idea what they're talking about, you know? Mm. You don't know how to respond. You don't know how to participate in uh, the social interactions that are taking place around you, you know? Um, and and uh, take, one of the things I'll take away from this talk is to keep reminding myself, this is what it's like for someone with a learning disability. You, you've opened my eyes, really, because mm. I, I rather thought that someone with a learning disability didn't really realize they had a learning disability, you know? So, mm -hmm. so the fact that you've been able to describe all of those frustrations uh, uh, that, that a person feels, you know, that's really, really helpful to me. Uh, and, and I'll take that away. Thank you. No worries. Thanks for Anyone else? We've got, still got a bit of time. So one last comment from anyone? Can I talk about something else? Can I talk about عن الـ الـ الأطفال اللي عندهم learning disability وإزاي نخلي المجتمع اللي حواليهم يقبلهم أو إزاي نتكلم معهم في الخدمة طب إزاي نعمل على تشجيعهم إنهم يتخطوا بقى الاستجمة اللي جات لهم دي من العالم اللي حوالينا بحيث إنهم يقبلوا الكلمة في مدارس الأحد ويقدروا يتفاعلوا معاها كمان في ليك of understanding عند الفاميلي لما بنيجي مثلا نحل مشكلة مع حد مثلا طفل ضرب طفل بس التاني ليرنينج ديسابيلتي فضرب التاني بعنف بحس ان الاهل yeah. مش مش انتقام بس هم زعلانين على اولادهم فازاي اعمل البالانس ده بحيث ان لا ازعل والده الطفل دوت ولا في نفس الوقت حاسس تانية ان مش مهم اللي حصل لابنها لا هو مهم ابنها اتالم فبرضو انا yeah. محتاجه اعرف ازاي اتصرف في مواقف زي دي شكرا and uh, thanks, Ika. Um, Auntie, is it okay? So there's, is it, we're going to have a bit of time for questions afterwards. Um, it'll be the first question I answer. Is that okay if we can answer it at the end of the presentation? Okay. Is that okay? Thank you, yeah. Auntie. So I just, I tried to reflect on this, on, on if I was a person with a learning disability, how I would feel in church. Now, let's look typically at our church day um, throughout, throughout the day. So we have a, a, a mass which for a child with learning disability is incredibly long and um, that's something to bear in mind so to be able to keep them engaged for that amount of time you are asking for a genuine miracle it's it's, it's just not feasible and um, that's not because they're finding it boring it's not because they are disinterested it's because they quite literally cannot stay focused on something for that long a period of time um, so we, we think then, OK, well, they're behaving or they're, they're acting in a certain way and, you know, they're shouting. Like I say, we, we see it a lot in mass and yet we don't give enough thought. Well, why are they doing that? They could be trying to communicate. I, I'm, I'm, this is so overwhelming. If you think about it, a lot of our um, uh, members of the church that do have learning disabilities, um, a really important aspect is they, they might have sensory issues. So by that, I mean, they might be really sensitive to the light. So if it's particularly bright that day, it might be too much. Think about all the, you know, the symbols and the deaf and the, the all the chants and, and the, the loud congregation responses and all of that. Somebody could be really, really sensitive and, and they could have such sensory overload when, when people are talking really, really loudly and that could make, make them incredibly distressed. Um, there's, there's a lot of people, there tends to be a lot of people in church. Somebody might find it really overwhelming being in a crowd. I've worked with two people so far that have both said that just being in a crowded space is such a trigger for them. So you don't know the person's internal triggers and how things like that can really manifest in their day to day. That, like I said, things might just be natural to us. We rock up to church on a Sunday. Yeah, it's busy. Oh, it's fine. We know the congregational responses. It's a bit loud. It's all right. You know, we, we don't we don't think about these things, whereas this is this could be such a big deal for somebody with learning disabilities. Then we move on to, for example, Sunday school. Now, Sunday school is, you know, a bit more concentrated. Um, like like Dad mentioned earlier, he said about how other children 
are interacting with that particular individual. And like Auntie mentioned, Auntie was talking about how, say, for example, if a child, you know, hits out in the Sunday school lesson and, you know, a fight breaks out between two of them. And how do you strike that balance between, you know, not shouting at the child because, you know, they've got a learning disability, but at the same time being fair with all the kids. So many things arise. But, you know, um, I actually spoke to an individual, a young boy in our church who does have learning disabilities and he literally described it to me as something in his head is constantly feeling like his head is his head is going to blow up and that something's pushing on me and um, against his head and it's going to burst every given opportunity so he constantly feels this frustration and when he literally physically described that to me I just thought gosh that was so overwhelming all the time so he said it, it, it literally can take something so small to annoy him because his head constantly feels like it's going to burst so these are things that we really really need to be taking into consideration and I think ultimately it, it's getting to know the person on such an individual level to know that person's triggers uh, for the sake of time I'm just going to keep going but thank you guys for all your contributions that was really great so now we get to the last question and the last part of the talk. So we've discussed everything in depth. So how can we, as the church, provide better support? So firstly, I want you all to ask yourselves individually the following question. Is our Coptic Orthodox Church a place where people with learning disabilities feel comfortable and more importantly, feel like they belong? Just quick fire responses. Uh, yes, no, what do people think? I don't think so, if I can put it in one word. Thanks, I agree. <laughs> I've got someone in the chat. Someone saying not really. Yeah, I agree. Anyone else? No, well, I think from my personal, very humble opinion, I, I don't think so either. <laughs> but I think we can always do more, we can always learn more, we can always learn more together as we go along and really, really try our best um, to be mindful of this. So, what have I done here? So just some um, tips. And like I say, we can talk about this further if, if, if anybody's really interested, you can always, we can always speak one, one, one to one, but this is just practical tips that we can do. Reasonable adjustments to make things accessible so the individual can participate. So an example of that is, for example, when we are um, sending out a, a, let a letter to the client, we would do something called um, making sure it's in easy read format. So that means there's lots of pictures, it's in really big font, it's literally the shortest sentences. So Buona Peter creates these really, really good um, materials for children in the church, you know, explaining to them what's happening in the mass and things like that, which I think are really, really beneficial. But perhaps somebody with learning disabilities might just want a booklet with just pictures so they can follow it visually just from pictures because they might not be able to read so that would be a reasonable adjustment another example would be for each Sunday school teacher to perhaps have an activity box to keep the individual busy so if you feel like they're starting to get a bit you know angsty or they're starting to you to feel a bit you know anxious or escalated you know they could they could go into the to the activity box and to keep them occupied whether that's a fidget spinner or if they have sensory needs to have a sensory box so to feel certain you know play or materials because it eases you know it, it, it's that sensory stimulation so these are some things to consider and we can and, and like I say you could talk about it one-to-one -one individually dependent on the needs of the person really important one that people forget is to make your expectations clear from the outset people with learning disabilities like I said they are finding it so difficult to decode the world that we live in so we can just get on with it you know you go into a church and you know socially what is expected of you you know what's expected of you you know that you go in you know when to stand up you know when to sit down you know when to be quiet you know when to engage you know when to participate and somebody with learning disabilities doesn't have that 
So if you ever want to make an expectation clear, you say it from the outset. And it's actually better to write it down because they have that as a visual reminder with them the whole time what's expected of them. So a really handy tip is before I have a session with a client that I know, for example, can get very anxious, I usually write down, we are going to talk for X amount of time. If you would like to have a break, you can ask for it. If you feel anxious, point to this piece of paper and we will stop. And then it's something else, for example, um, uh, try your best to listen to me and to answer my questions. And I give that to them before every um, like every appointment so they know what's expected of them from the start. So they, they can refer to that any time and they can point to it if they're struggling. And, and I find that that's really effective and it works for pretty much all the clients that I work with. Very, very important is always cater your language. Use clear, simple, concise language at all times. We don't go in with really, really long sentences and talk a lot and talk really fast. Speak very slowly, speak very calm. And something that always, that people always forget to do with people with learning disabilities is you need to stop to check for understanding. So every so often, just make sure that they are understanding what you're saying. Because a lot of the time, out of fear and embarrassment, they might be nodding along because they're so anxious and worried that they might look silly or stupid or whatever. So they might be masking that they don't understand when in fact, you know, they're really struggling and they don't know what you're, what you're, what you're saying. So it's important for us to be the ones to open that conversation and that dialogue and be like, oh, oh do you understand? Would you like me to repeat that again? And a lot of the time they will be honest and say, no, can you repeat that? Or no, I'm fine, you can carry on. But so that's a really important one to always check for understanding throughout. And also check that you understand what they are saying or meaning, because as well, um, you might misconstrue something that they said, you know, and it's important to make sure that you know what that person is trying to communicate to you. So just make sure you're saying, oh, is that right? Did I get that right? Have I understood what you wanted to say? Visuals and symbols are so effective and they can really develop, develop the communication aids. Um, I have a client who is able and can speak, however, really, really finds it difficult to ask for tricky things. So um, people with learning difficulties, can, uh, dis disabilities sometimes find it really difficult to ask for help. Again, you know, they feel embarrassed or they feel like it shows that they've got it wrong. So we have a visual where it says, I need help. And she always picks it up and gives it to me if she wants help and then I, I say what do you need help with and she says just explaining it further and it's just a way to kind of ease that communication and that barrier that awkward barrier of saying oh can you actually explain that further so we can look at catering that and and look at the the, the people that we have in the church perhaps visuals might work better for them if they're feeling stressed they can have something that says I need a break and they can give it to their Sunday school teacher it's just I need a bit of a time out I'm, I'm really finding it hard and they can give it to someone that they trust and, and they're close to so that's something to consider be concrete so that means always use a very literal speech so if it's raining don't say oh it's raining cats and dogs because we can use very literal speech and they might literally think it's raining cats and dogs. So I'm just using that as an example because it's an example we use at work, but we have to be very concrete with the language that we use because they take every single thing that we say literally. Another thing is follow the lead of a person and go at their own pace. So if you feel that that person requires you to go a bit slower, you go a bit slower. If you feel like they are really understanding and, 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 and they would rather you just keep going and going at a faster pace, go at a faster pace, but always base it and base your pace around how the person is um, responding. And last thing that is also very important is you should always give warning for transitions. Transitions can be really, really tricky with people with learning disabilities. Like I said before, it's decoding a world that we all live in and take for granted. Like, you know, we finish the mass, what happens? We go into the hall and then we go into the hall for a bit and then we go into Sunday school. Or, you know, sorry, if this is pre-COVID, post-COVID is we finish the mass and then you go to hymns and then after hymns you go to Sunday school. Uh, people might find that transition really, really difficult because they just focus so hard on coping in that particular context. And now they have to start afresh and cope in a new context. So something that really works well is drawing five circles. And what I do is, is I 
I cross off the circles. I've used that example here, it's just crossing that circle off here and crossing it off as time as, as, as it goes on and just go, okay, we've got four more circles to go until we're going to on to the next activity or the next part of our day. And that really eases the transition because they know what's coming next. So always try your best to ease transitions as much as possible. Now, I think it's important in our service to always link it, linking it back to Christ and, and ultimately our aim is to be more like him. How can we learn to be more like him? So when you look in the mirror, you don't see yourself, you see him. Now, interestingly, I took a mini survey with the people that I work with in the community learning disability team. So whether that was nurses, consultants, psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, uh, whoever, speech and language therapists. And one thing, the first thing they all said is in order for you in your church, when you deliver this uh, talk, one thing they need to learn is acceptance, but not on surface level, real, real acceptance. Eight of, of the staff members said that and said the most important thing is genuine and radical acceptance. So that's actually really, really, that's what that's what challenged me because I think you can accept someone on the surface side, you know, oh, yeah, I know they've got a learning disability, you know, yeah, yeah, they can come to Sunday school, yeah, they can sit, you know, they can take part, but are we really accepting them? Are we really, really genuinely accepting them like you would accept your own child? Are you treating them like, am I treating them like how I would treat, um, you know, my sibling if, if my sibling had a learning disability? You know, it's genuine acceptance, not just a surface level of, hi, you're right, da, da, da. Accepting and accommodating to them in a way that really, really makes them feel like they belong. There is no reason to treat them any differently empower empowerment so all members of the body of christ have a vital role to play we all have different strengths we all bring something so the verse strength springs to mind i can do all things through christ who strengthens me so if we are living by that and if we live that for ourselves why can we not empower individuals with learning disabilities to live the same to feel like that they can do the things that they want they can live an empowering life they can have an enhanced quality of life and they can do it with the help of god and we need to be the people that kind of that bridge and that to be the reminder for them that they can do these things now the most important thing is making them feel like they belong it's so 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 vital that they don't just feel like they are just included and invited they that they genuinely belong and I think belonging somewhere is is what counts it's not just about being invited to come and sit in it's belonging it's accommodating to that person it's being tolerant of everything that person brings and the best example that we have is Jesus himself and I know that the talk focuses on learning disabilities but here we can say that he welcomed all people infectious people disabled people adulterers, social outcasts, foreigners, women, you know, he was revolutionary in who he, who he um, spent his time with and who he befriended. So I think that that's the ultimate example that we could live up to. Now, I wanted to touch on something. God's deepest means of communication doesn't come in words to the seemingly clever and wise. If we read this verse, Luke 10, 21, it says, at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Now, when I read that, I, uh, I look at that and I think, well, it's very interesting to see that the people that seemingly are wise and know everything and super, super clever, actually our father in heaven didn't reveal any didn't reveal that to them he revealed it to the little children or to the ones that you know seem like they don't know a lot or simple simple minds often people with learning disabilities could be seen as foolish in the eyes of this world but actually they are wise and precious towards god and we can see god's special purpose for those with learning disabilities Another um, verse, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. 
Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And there's a beautiful quote by Amos Young that sums it up. If people with intellectual disabilities represent the falling foolishness of the world, what hinders are viewing them as embodying the wisdom of God? And I just thought it was really important to touch on because it really, really connects people with learning disabilities and how they have such a special purpose and such a special place in the eyes of God. And we need to always remem remember that when we are dealing with them. So that comes back to the quote that I um, spoke of in the very beginning and it relates to inclusion. And it says, inclusion is a great start, but belonging is the end goal. Being in the room is not the same as being part of the family. And I think that's, that's the stretch we have to make. That's what we need to do. We need to not just allow people with learning disabilities to be in the room, but we need to make sure that they are part of the family. And I think that that's the bit that's missing and we need to make sure we create that shift so they feel like they're part of the family. Thank you for listening. Um, and Jeff, has anyone got any questions? Uh, let me say, first of all, thank you, Mary, for that. Uh, that was that was really wonderful, really, really wonderful. Um, very insightful uh, and inspiring. Um, I hope that in this series of presentations, we'll be able to have um, Professor John Swinton speak to us. He's uh, an immensely important voice, Christian voice, speaking about mm -hmm. uh, disability and theology and the Christian life. So I hope Definitely. that um, in a month to come, some in what some month in the future, he'll speak to us. But thank you, Mary. That was yeah. really wonderful. Really, really wonderful. Thank you. Please ask Mary, questions. Uh, ask questions of Mary. Um, uh, Maram, you had your hand up a bit a bit while ago. Yes, Maram, go on, please. Yes, thank you very much, Father. Thank you, Mary, for such a, a, a lovely presentation. Very, um, um, very informative. And um, some of the comments you made um, were real eye openers. So thank you very much. I, I just, um, I worry about mm -hmm. um, how much emphasis we place in our culture and unfortunately in our churches as well on academic achievement yes. and that sometimes um, sometimes our children are um, kind of taught or raised to believe that their value really depends on on how much they achieve academically um, yeah, to, to the extent that sometimes if you don't make it to medical school or if you don't make it to grammar school you're a you failure like you're less. <laughs> yes exactly and you feel a lot less than than your you know than other other children in church um, and I just I think this has a huge impact on children with um, average to above average IQs and I just wonder how how much it, it might impact um, children who have learning difficulties or children with mild to moderate learning disabilities who, who are kind of conscious um, of their difficulties. And, and I, I just wanted to hear your thoughts as a psychologist mm -hmm. on, on um, you know, how, how that affects children and on how we as a church might be able to change that culture. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a really good point. Sorry, are you asking in, in relation to people with average, average um, IQs now? Both really, Mary. Both because Thanks. I think it affects both. It affects children with average to above, above average IQ. Um, mm -hmm. because I think we encourage competitiveness, we encourage comparison, which mm -hmm. I think is very unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it would probably affect children with learning difficulties even more because they mm -hmm. feel quite helpless that they're not able to achieve. It's not something they can control. They can't work harder to to mm -hmm. to achieve more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I fully agree. I fully agree with everything you said. Um, I think there's a couple of points. Firstly, I think that in order, just because something's always been done a certain certain way, <clears throat> and just because a certain mindset has always been adapted, doesn't doesn't make it correct. And I think that that applies here in terms of the <clears throat> the belief that if that if you are not a doctor dentist a lawyer or like you said like the highest year or whatever then you are unworthy and I think that the first step is to challenge and I think we are growing um you know the, the late the younger generations now 
career choice wise is a lot more diverse and actually a lot more spread than it was um, when I was doing my GCSEs and A-levels, which is really good. And I do feel like that that cultural shift is happening. I think a lot of it is to do with um, how parents speak to their children, because I find that if you are in a household where your parents are just encouraging you to do your best and the focus is on your worth and your academic achievement, but your worth in God's eyes and, and where your worth lies, I think that's the crucial element here. Um, and I think that the more parents encourage children in that respect, then I think that there's less I think that stigma and I, uh, I think that kind of that belief system would decrease but I think a lot of it is to do with self-worth I think a lot of it is how you view yourself a lot of it is how you yeah it's how you how you perceive how others view you it's, it's, it's very com I feel like it's very complex and there's so many things interlinking but I think the first thing is to challenge it to be aware of it and to just ensure that when it comes to you know our own children to ensure that we are pointing them in direct in the right direction of reminding them where their worth lies <laughs> sorry I feel like I could go on <laughs> but yeah don't know if that's them um, yes that thank you thank you very much Mary I think <laughs> it's just sometimes really hard to speak to parents because they feel like um if, if you say anything along those lines they feel like you're encouraging their children to be lazy <laughs> which is obviously not not the point at all mm, mm, um, mm. but if you have any tips on how to do that that would be brilliant mm, I'll probably think about that actually because I think that's a really good thing to reflect on because you are right I think it's very good in theory to go yeah just challenge it but actually it's actually really difficult to challenge that especially when I think as a as a priest uh I, in lots of things in my in my service and in our service as priests, uh, it's best not to challenge anything head on. Um, that often just creates more problems. But to be to be a voice um, speaking of another view of what worth is, you know, not not as if the the other views are wrong and must be silenced, you know, um, but to make sure every child has at least someone in the church, the priest, you know, maybe a Sunday school servant, you know, uh, at least so every child hears that they are valuable in another way as well, you know, not instead of, I think that's, that's not necessarily productive, but as well as, you know, um, yeah. and, and I see that as part of my role, you know, even from this talk, you know, I need to make a point of going around every child every Sunday uh, making sure that they know they are valued and loved for themselves by me, you know, um, and by yeah. others. Uh, so I, I think that sometimes the, the head-on collision with culture isn't isn't always the most productive. But there should always be another voice that the children are hearing, you know, to complement what they're hearing uh, from others, which isn't isn't wrong, what they're hearing. But there is an, there is another side to life uh, and worth and value which which they must hear. Sorry. Thanks, Sabrina. You have three hands up, Mar uh, Mary. Oh, uh, I, I don't know. Um, Nick, is I that you? Do you want to? Does Nick Nick want to speak first? Yeah. Sure. Um, that's uh, yeah. Okay, that's better. Um, thank you very much. Um, that was very interesting um, oh. talk and oh. and very thought provoking. Oh. Um, Thank you. I was struck by your your analogy um, at the end uh, of uh, Christ's welcoming people of all different um, types, often people who wouldn't be welcome, um, as you say, the the diseased and the adulterer and so forth. And I was interested to hear your advice as a professional, uh, a professional, about how one might negotiate. A certain problem that comes from perhaps a disanalogy um, in respect to that. Um, so it seems that you know Christ um, welcomed the diseased uh, and healed them, and he welcomed the adulterer, um, but told her to leave her life of sin. I, I I suspect that someone with a learning disability is is perhaps less tractable to that possibility of healing, and we have to negotiate them as, and as you say accept them in a different way than the immediate exception acceptance and then healing mm. how how does one negotiate in cases in which there might 
be um, uh, potential clashes. I'm thinking perhaps you have somebody in the uh, congregation who has Asperger's syndrome. They're very sensitive to loud noises. You might have someone mm. with a learning disability who expresses their joy in the service by making mm. loud noises. Mm. Do you as a professional have any sense of sensitive ways to, to negotiate those sorts of things where we need to accept both both people? Um, I, I, I don't know if that makes sense as a question. No, that, that definitely does make sense. So yeah, that's a tricky one because obviously each person comes with their own presentation and their own needs. Um, as you say, you know, somebody might really, really hate noise and somebody else might be really, really loud and that's them stimming. I think then that that is a sense, that is a case of being very delicate to ensure that we meet both of their needs. So for example, I can only speak for example for, for our church. We have a crying room. So if the individual with Asperger's is is getting increasingly escalated due to the other child who is being really loud and they are happy we just take the child who is being really you know the child who's being really loud into the quiet room um until they might settle and and bring and them come back out again or vice versa and I think that we can make these accommodations I think a, a lot of the time a lot of it is literally just can be very simple things um, that we can that we can change or do it's almost like it's I don't want to say it's like uh, I don't mean it I don't mean it like oh it's just common sense but then sometimes we try and think of these really really elaborate things when I think a lot of it just comes down to understanding the two individuals I also find that parents if they have a child with a learning disability or autism are quite understanding and compassionate towards each other because they know the struggle themselves if you know what I mean so I think that as long as there is very open communication within the congregation and, as well, and obviously this is we're living in a very very you know I live in a very naive idealistic world where everyone communicates freely and openly and we all cater to each other etc etc however I do feel, feel like there should be a more of a sense of a team within the church where we all pull together and help each other and we all genuinely try our best to kind of be accountable to ensuring that people's experiences in the church are really good um so even if it's somebody you see somebody that's becoming distressed because of a particular reason it doesn't you don't have to be a professional you can just go and sit with them what's going on are you okay and or you know just learn learn more about that person give them that time I don't know if that's answered any of your question it's quite it's it's a very good question. no I, I, I think I think that was a really good answer because I was clearly looking for something too abstract and one size fits all and then you you brought it down to the the sense that no this is something that's very concrete where you're going to have to know people individually as part of the community and for that sure. makes so much sense to me so that's a really helpful answer thank you no it's okay I'm sorry I just I think as well you've got to remember that like you, you know yourselves as an individual within a community, put learning disabilities, autism, etc. aside, I might prefer something that somebody else might not like, and we learn to compromise and we learn to accommodate and, and work together. And I think the same kind of thing needs to do with people with learning disabilities in the sense that even if we're the ones doing the compromising, that's okay, but we compromise to make their world as safe and as comfortable as possible. So that they can still enjoy church and it's still a very positive experience but in a way that we're doing the compromising to kind of alleviate them of any of that kind of yeah so yeah thank you for the question it's really good it made me thank think you. a lot <laughs> um we Dad? better just have these we better just have these last two questions and then all right yeah no it's okay <laughs> dad Hi, it's a comment really, and, and I'm not sure if you will, uh, 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 Dr. Maram, and, and, and you talked about it. We are, we tend to compare adults and uh, as adults, we cannot ignore this and uh, our children end up taking this. So mm. part, of, part of this is that we are in a, in a, in, in a modern society that is mainly self-centered. 
everything mm -hmm. is about achievement and everything and even in as everyone knows here who is listening probably in the interview you are asked about what are your weaknesses and you have to find a clever way of getting something very 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 good about you and you say it as if it's weakness um to to score even another point um uh, the the point i'm making is jesus when he gave the talents the 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 parable of the talents he mentioned someone given five talents someone given two talents someone given one talent um the the problem with the guy who had the one talent not that he had one talent that he did not work with his talent so if he ended up working with that one talent bringing one talent he would have been as successful as the person who had the five talents and the person who had the two talents jesus praise or the jesus in the his parable mentioned that the, the the person who had the two talents was praised exactly as the person who had the five talents so it's important for us to tell uh, and we did this with our children personally um to and i think everyone should we should do our best to do that that we should not compare we should remember that every one of us has five talents in one thing and two talents in one thing and one talent in one thing we don't need to compare ourselves because we will have our own areas of uniqueness the important thing is to get our career and our life and our service and everything and what we love and what we fulf feel fulfilled in and our service and and what god gave us the, the the gift in no one should be not the whole community should be doctors not all the community should be dentists and th th that that doesn't make sense some people are are talented artists some people are talented communicators etc so what we should do is to look at our talents really know ourselves in the light of christ and then work with our talents to the, to his glory without looking around us and in doing this we will be more successful than than anyone else if we want to be someone else if we are ourselves in the name of christ we will hopefully be the most successful and fulfilled person we should be um, um, i hope i make sense no that makes sense that's a great comment dad thank you very much i completely agree um Anne marie Hi, sorry, I'll be quick so you guys can go to bed. All right. um, I just wanted to comment on the first question that was asked. Mm -hmm. um, I was an individual that experienced the, you know, you're not going to study medicine, so it's very hard for us to accept some situation. I've been very open about it in the past. And I think I just wanted to say, um, as a sign of gratitude to the current Sunday school teachers, um, I had a Sunday school teacher who knew about the situation and instead of saying malish or pray and it, just wait be patient I think I had a teacher that was like telling me different career options that mm. would kind of navigate my own mindset or mm. so I think just like if we continue doing that providing a kind of another information point for you know upcoming students and upcoming um, youth um saying that listen okay you're not you, you're stuck in this situation this is what we have or this is what is like available mm -hmm. so that even if they can, if they're struggling to reach communication outside of the church they don't feel trapped that the only thing that we can provide is patience and prayer um yeah. which i know prayer is important but you you know what i mean um no, but i think the question i have is how do we kind of steer away from the negative comments that receive from you know mature members of the church i think as young adults now we are all kind of you know open-minded and up to date with um the current events and current mindsets and how we communicate to each other but i think sometimes some comments from other members that are not as you know i don't want to be rude <laughs> enlightened right. in the modern world um, how do we kind of um, move from those comments or those discouraging remarks? And I hope I'm not creating a negative environment by saying this, by the way. I just no, want to know no. references. Because I think sometimes people's words are a lot painful, a lot more painful than like others may imagine, even like the remarks and things like that. So what would be your advice? And thank you uh, for listening. That's all right. Uh, I think it's a very good question. I think it all still comes back to self-esteem and self-worth 
um, if my worth, if I know that my worth is in God and in how God created me and I'm the person and I'm becoming the person that God is creating, then, and if I, but it's not just I know that, I truly believe that and I truly live that, it's a different story. So, you know, uh, being transparent, I struggle with that. If somebody said something mean to me, I'd believe it. <laughs> I'd believe it in a flash. I'd be like, oh, they're right. Da, da, da. And I'd, you know, catastrophize it. However, if I genuinely believed and knew where my worth came from and to whom I belonged to, I think it would be a different story. So I guess we cannot control what others will say or do. We will never be able to control that. And we need to bring acceptance to that. I think um what we can do is control our reaction to it and this isn't a spiritual phrase but one of my favorite things I think Eleanor Roosevelt said it is no one can make you feel inferior without your consent so that's something that I would genuinely genuinely try and carry with me that whenever someone says something or does something that hurts is to to remember that that it's it's your choice whether you allow that to make you feel inferior or not and we have the the blessing and the power that we know that we belong to God so um yeah I think we need to it's more just increasing our faith and our relationship with God so then if we are closer to God we care less about what people think of us I know it's a very spiritual response and I know but I, I think it's it's more uh, advice to me than it is to anyone <laughs> I think I think also that um by the time by the time you're 18 or 19 um and making choices, it it's it's difficult when when other people are thinking you should be making other choices. It's hard to find self worth if you don't already have it. Um, but as a church, um, and really building on the model of 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 caring for those with learning disabilities, but in all of these lectures, I'm seeing that the way we deal with a person with with a disability, if we say that, is the way we should be dealing with most people, with everyone. You know. So yeah. uh, if, if we are trying to build self-worth, real self-worth in those with a learning disability, we should be building that into every child, every young person in our church. Uh, and so, so from their youngest age, uh, there should be other voices in the church, you know, um, not as if there's a great disagreement, but there should be other voices that are constantly saying, you are valuable to God. You are valuable in yourself because God has made you. Whatever you do with your life, you know, not getting involved in um, in career career advice and stuff like that. But we, we can say to young children, whatever you do with your life, God is waiting to be there with you. You know, um, I, I think we have to we have to really. Uh, begin with the youngest children um, to help them see how valuable they are uh, and, and everything that we've, we've heard about children with autism, uh, children with learning disabilities, everything we're going to continue learning. It, it's something that I'm feeling more and more has to apply to all of our relations with one another. Uh, in many of our congregations, we do have a different a diversity of languages. You know, we, we are often not quite understanding each other. Uh, I sit and talk with someone and I realize they don't quite understand what I mean. And they speak to me when they're mostly an Arabic speaker. And I realize I don't quite understand what they mean. Um, and this is this is similar to how how when I'm talking to a child who has a learning disability, uh, it, it is wrong for me to assume that because I have spoken, they have understood. Um, all of this, I really feel increasingly as a priest. The problem is is for those of us who who, who are neurotypical, if we want to say that, you know, uh, the ones who are in a better place in terms of our, our health and our ability, we have the responsibility uh, to ensure that all of those others who are struggling in different ways, and so this applies to all of our struggles, we have the responsibility to help everyone participate. Uh, and so by the time someone is ready to go to university, or, or maybe they won't go to university, maybe they'll go to college, maybe they're in a sheltered education, and they won't even finish school in the way that many others will. In all of these cases, every child should feel already that they are valuable because God has made them and God is preparing them for an exciting life where they have something to, com to, co uh, to, to, to contribute, not only to society, but to the church. This requires great activity on our part. And that's the whole purpose of these meetings month by month. I hope that we'll have a day conference later on 
Uh, the aim is to be entirely practical. How do we become better able to serve those in our midst? And not only those in our community now, but those who will come to our Christian communities in the future. How are we to be better prepared to serve each one? Um, and in conclusion, I thank Mary very, very much for this talk today. We've had, uh, we've had three very high quality talks so far. I've been so pleased to sit uh, and hear and listen and then uh, take part in the conversations. Uh, thank God, uh, thank God for, for what I think he's doing among us uh, at this time. Uh, this is such an important topic and it has so much to teach us, not only about those with a diagnosed problem, but the way we deal with one another in general. Uh, it is time, we, 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 must, we, we must close. Um, uh, so let me pray a blessing uh, and then send you on your way in peace. I, this has been recorded and uh, I will upload it to uh, Facebook, uh, not to Facebook, upload it uh, onto YouTube. But there is a Facebook group called Coptic Orthodox Mental Health Awareness, where I'm posting information about these, uh, these presentations and other things that we can discuss uh other resources we can post there so so if you're on facebook join coptic orthodox mental health awareness um but god bless you all uh let's close in prayer heavenly father we thank you that as we have gathered with uh, hearts full of care and concern for every member of our communities uh and, and that our service be filled with your own love and and your own compassion towards everyone but we thank you that once again, you have inspired those who have spoken to us. Uh, you have given us insight. You have uh, poured from their own mouths and from their own hearts uh, the concern which you have for these, your children in the church, not only children in age, but children according uh, to our relationship with you as our Heavenly Father. Help us to share, Heavenly Father, this care and compassion you have for each one. Uh, help each one of us to have in mind some of the things which we have heard this evening uh, and give us a continuing desire to put them into practice, especially here in our Diocese of the Midlands, but wherever uh, people may perhaps uh, follow these resources. We pray that this concern in our Coptic Orthodox Church for those who are dealing with mental health challenges and for the positive mental health of all might be something that in your will and in your wisdom and in your way, uh, we are able to bring to some sort of a productive uh, and fruitful conclusion among ourselves. Thank you again for this uh, interesting and helpful evening. And be with us, giving us peace in our hearts and our homes, and hearing us as we lift our voices to you, our Heavenly Father, and praying, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one through Jesus Christ our Lord. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Depart in peace. The Lord be with you all. Amen. Thank you again, Mary. I'm sure we all thank, thank you. you for that. That was really a very, very wonderful talk. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you so much. See, thank you, guys. Thank you.